Happy. From the Foundation Studio on Biloxi's Back Bay, welcome to Super Talk Outdoors, where we celebrate every single Monday at lunchtime the world-class outdoors to the state of Mississippi. And I love the beginning of this show when we get to listen to, once again, Steve Azar's One Mississippi. What a great song. I'm so honored to have that as a theme song for Super Talk Outdoors. One day, maybe, one day, that song will be the state song for Mississippi. It's just such an amazing song, and it's so true, too. It celebrates this incredibly diverse place we love and call Mississippi. I want to thank you for joining us on the powerful Super Talk Mississippi radio network. But if you're on C Spire TV at Super Talk TV, um, uh, Thank you for listening there, too. But if you're listening on Facebook or YouTube or your favorite podcast, it's January the 31st, 2022. By the way, as I say every week, I'm from, coming to you from the Foundation Studio every Monday. And, and I said, you know, my th the team and I are just thrilled to be here. We really are. Um, the official name of the foundation is actually the Mississippi Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks Foundation. They're not to be confused with the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. This is an independent nonprofit. They were formed back in 2003, about 20 years ago. And uh, it's a group of dedicated volunteers from across the state who form this foundation board, and they provide independent uh, financial support that helps the state's conservation efforts. And they're really also focused on critical generational outdoors issues that are important to Mississippi. We're lucky to have them. So this, the team at Super Talk Outdoors is thrilled to have the foundation as the title sponsor for this show. Uh, I spent the weekend up at my place in the Mississippi Delta as duck season and, hunt and deer season come to a close, at least for adults. Uh, we have the uh, youth duck uh, hunt coming up next weekend. My place in the Mississippi Delta is uh, is that's so special. We had a great duck hunt yesterday in Chula. We uh, we brought some uh, some food to the blind. We cooked some bacon and some sausage and some biscuits. Think about think about being in that duck blind with six of your best friends. You know, just enjoying some you know, great duck hunting and the smell of bacon, fresh bacon. Man, as my friend Travis Dunn says, it's the ultimate social sport. Duck hunting is the ultimate social sport. Six guys together in a duck blind creating, once again, amazing memories. And, you know, again, that's what this show is all about, family, friends, and the outdoors. Um, you know, we're here to celebrate the, the capital of the outdoors in Mississippi, and I got to do it once again over this past weekend, as did thousands of people across this great state and others who visit this great state. Um, man, they know. They know this is a special place. Before I left for the Delta, I actually took my offshore boat for a spin. Um, it's amazing to me now to think about it because time flies so quickly that we are now hoping in a, the next couple of weeks, hoping for a window to do some yellowfin tuna out, out at the horseshoe rigs off our coast. Man, when you hit that window right, it is a very, very special deal. The changing of the seasons in Mississippi. So as duck and hunt, hunting and deer hunting come to a close, people are already thinking about turkey and offshore and backwater fishing in coastal Mississippi. Uh, this, this show will change with the seasons because there's always something to do in the capital of the outdoors in the United States here in Mississippi. And as I, as I mentioned, man, does time fly when you're having fun. In the first half of the show, we're going to have Secretary of State Michael Watson join us, and we're going to talk about how to keep Mississippi the capital of the outdoors and, and the world. Um, and then also uh, in the second half of the show, Houston Havens, who's the waterfowl coordinator for the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. He's going to join me. We're going to talk about how did the waterfowl season go. We're also going to talk about the youth hunt, the two, uh, 2022 youth waterfowl camp that's coming up. Uh, I'm really looking forward to that conversation. Without any further ado, let's move over to my friend, Michael Watson, the Secretary of State for the state of Mississippi. How you doing, my friend? Man, I'm great this morning. How are you, Ricky? I'm doing really good, man. I'm, I'm really doing good. Um, so, look, we are lucky to live in this great state of Mississippi when you think about the outdoors, aren't we? It's incredible. Uh, and you, you talked about it in your intro there. The different seasons as they move along, there's always something to do in Mississippi. And, and you mentioned it, getting out in your boat. I, my daughter and I were in our little bay boat back in late December. Now we caught a little little warm spell, as you could imagine. Uh, and then, you know, the next weekend I was in a duck blind. So uh, going from the water to, to the delta to duck hunt. And then last week I had a chance to duck hunt in the morning and squirrel hunt in the afternoon. So 
Uh, again, the, the seasons change. There's always something to do here, and it is the capital of the outdoors. What an incredible place in which we live. Well, my, my son, Jordan, uh, my, my daughter, Tori, she she loves to fish, and my sons, Jordan and Justin, love to hunt and fish. And my son, Justin, actually lives in New York City, and one thing that brings him back home is, is deer season. And uh, but my son Jordan gets to go up every chance he goes, uh, he can. And this particular trip, this is the last, last, uh, last big hunt of the season, and he didn't even take his deer gun out of the out of the uh, out of the case, man. He was focused on afternoon and morning duck hunting the entire weekend, and just absolutely loving it. Um, you know, so th- I know how he got it. I know how I got it. I talk about it on the show all the time. I mean, my I was lucky to have a father who liked to hunt and a grandfather's who liked to hunt. And spend, my dad worked really hard, but my grandfather's, when my dad was working, would take me fishing. I fell in love with it. And I often say, man, it's the thing that kind of kept me out of trouble growing up. I was just, I, I would rather, instead of going gallivanting, I'd rather just go do some great fishing or spend the night out on Courthouse Road Pier here in coastal Mississippi and catch some redfish and sharks and whatever. But when you think back on your life, where did the influence for the outdoors come from for you? Got it. So really two great stories, Ricky. One, uh, obviously fishing and the other hunting and, and how we got to start into both of those. But fishing, uh, my dad, again, loved the Pascagoula River. And so we were out one morning, my very first time to go fishing. And the very first time I caught a fish, I don't really remember it because I was asleep in the front seat. Uh, and my dad said, hey, hey, look, you know, my, my cork had gone under and uh, caught a little brim, my very first fish. And uh, that was it. Off to the races from there, really, you know, grew a love for fishing, uh, living on the coast, and, and that's obviously what we do down here. But then deer hunting. Uh, my mom's from Knox of Pater, Mississippi, up in Winston County. And so my dad would, would take me hunting when we would be at Thanksgiving or different times up there. And uh, the very first buck I killed was with my dad. We were walking into the woods, and uh, it was kind of ridgy in there, and, and a, there was an eight-point chasing a doe coming down a ridge. And my dad just, you know, I, I didn't see him. My dad saw him first, and all I heard was stop. So I stopped and he you know, did his little finger motion and told me to look over there and I saw it and got real nervous. And uh, he was again, kind of kind of trotting after that doe. Well, my dad had a grunt. And so he grunted and the deer stopped and all I heard was shoot. <laughs> so uh, I had my, my gun up and there's a 30 off six my grandfather had given me. And it just a, just a magical memory uh, of those times. I, I hit the deer, but my dad shot as well. So I think we both actually <laughs> killed the deer, but just a great memory. Well, I mean, <clears throat> that's what it's all about. And and what 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 I'm impressed by, Michael, is that you've been really focused on making sure Mississippi maintains this whole notion of being the capital of the outdoors in the in the United States. That what we need is a unified sort of conservation plan about wildlife uh, habitat improvement and other things like that. Uh, we had the conservation trust fund that was introduced last year in the in the legislature. It passed the House 117 to two, but it stalled out in the Senate. This is an effort to create a dedicated funding source, create the opportunity for us to be able to focus on being innovative, as it as it relates to creating better habitat for for wildlife. There are other aspects to it too, involving clean water, et cetera. Right. But but simultaneous to that, you actually did something incredibly impressive. You brought together some of the top conservation leaders in the state, organizations and people, and you really charged them with trying to, and I, I had the summary, and the summary is very impressive about conservation priorities, but you, you charged them with, with uh, sort of summarizing for you where the opportunities might be. What led you to do that? Yeah, a couple of things. Number one, obviously, I, I watched that debate from afar last year and, and didn't pay a whole lot of attention to it. But, you know, as a hunter, as a fisher, obviously, that something like that comes up. You want to listen to it a bit. But after that was really where it, it, it triggered for me. I was down in, in Mississippi State, the Extension Service here, um, and I met with Renee Collini. I'm not sure if you know Renee or not. But she was talking about some of the issues in conservation along the coast. And one of the things that she said was, look, individually, there's really not much we can do to, to make this better. But together, collectively, if we have a focus on conservation, we can really do some good things. And when she said that, it, it really just triggered my mind. Wait a minute. How do we do this? How do we move forward? And so out of that was born the Conservation Task Force. And you mentioned it before. We've got some of the brightest, sharpest minds in the country, not just in Mississippi, but in the country. And it's a group of, of state agencies. So you've got DEQ, uh, Wildlife Fishers and Park Forestry. You've you got a bunch of groups 
uh, that are there from the state side, but you also have these NGOs, uh, Ducks Unlimited, TNC, Mississippi Wildlife Federation, the list goes on and on and on. It is a big list. And so I thought, you know, one of the things I've seen in government over the time here that I've been in state service is look, too many times we, we, you know, we silo off over here. This is our area. You don't touch this. And, and this, we will, we're going to work on this. You don't, you don't touch that. And we miss the opportunity for teamwork. Let's do this, Michael. Let's do this. That's a, actually a really good point. Uh, this, this notion of bringing them together as a team to say, where should our priorities be? How do we create a long-term and sustainable conservation effort in Mississippi? When we come back, we'll continue the conversation with Michael Watson, the Secretary of State for the state of Mississippi. See you after this break. Leading the conversation on Mississippi's outdoors, it's Super Talk Outdoors with Ricky Matthews on Super Talk Mississippi. Mississippi. Welcome back to Super Talk Outdoors from the Foundation Studio. I have um, Michael Watson, the Secretary of State for the state of Mississippi. And as I said before, we're not going to talk about policies and politics and all these things that, in, that, that are – we're going to leave that up to Paul Gallo and Gerard. But from time to time, we will talk about why what happens in Jackson matters to you as outdoorsmen. And, I mean, there's no way to avoid a conversation like that because our goal is to keep Mississippi the capital of the outdoors and this, this great United States. And the reality is we're kind of falling behind right now. Other, other states have created conservation trust funds. They're getting incredible matching funds from the federal government. Georgia, for example, turned $20 million into nearly $100 million. We don't have such a fund here in Mississippi. We're not aligned around what are the goals that we should be aspiring to so that we can make conservation a top priority for this state. And that's what Michael Watson and I were talking about when we went to, to the break. He brought some of the leading minds in our state, really some of them are the leading minds in the country literally some of the most incredible minds in the country as it relates to conservation and conservation goals. How do we, how do we preserve our wildlife legacy in this state? And uh, we were just talking about bringing the team together and charging them. And that's where we were when we went to break. So pick it up from there, Michael. Yeah. So again, you know, roughly 30 or more folks that we've got on our team. And the last thing that we did in our last meeting, two things. Number one, I thought it was very important for them to get all of the chairmen in the House and in the Senate before them to say, hey, look, here are the conservation measures that are coming before our committees. Because again, relationships matter, teamwork matters. I wanted them to see those individuals in that in that space. And let's talk. Let's talk about the issues that are important to us. But back to our task force, you know, the thing that we were doing there was let's look at the goals. We put out a survey to all the members and said, look, what are the most important things that you see? within your agency, but also across the state that we need to address in our plan. And so the goal is, let's put a, a plan together for the entire state. You know, if it's dealing with aquifers in the Delta uh, or sea rise along the coast or CWD or our duck population, whatever it is, conservation, put all this plan together for the entire state. So we all are singing on the same sheet. Uh, and it's been a, a fantastic success so far. And I've been really impressed with everybody that's coming in and laying down their labels Hey, let's all talk together. What's best for Mississippi? Well, if you look at, I mean, it's very clear. It's very clear. And sort of uh, this, the, the conservation trust fund that, that we're talking about would address a lot of these things. But it's very clear that some action needs to be taken, at least to align state leaders around how do we succeed in this area. For example, uh, most of them believe they don't have they don't have their proper resources to be able to get the job done. They like the staff they need. They like dedicated funding. I read an article this morning, incidentally, that talked about staging projects for the future. These are not like one-year projects. Many times they're multi-year projects. So when you only have like funding, one-time funding, it doesn't help you the next year and the next year. And if you have to wait for allocations, there has to be dedicated funding. They do talk about you know the bureaucracy and all of that, but but one of the most important things they talk about is private land. Because 90% of Mississippi, when you take out water that, you know, lakes and whatever that are owned by people, uh, is owned by 90% as, as private land. So you can't have a serious conservation effort in our state if you don't include private land, can you? No, it's a, it's a huge piece. And again, uh, I think it splits about 80, 20, 80 private, 20 public uh, when you look at Mississippi as a whole. But one of the things to that point exactly, Ricky, was I was looking at, I think it was Montana. Uh, where they there's public land, and so they allow farmers to allow their cattle to graze on this public land. In return, they put in dollars for conservation efforts on their private land. You've got things in Arkansas, Minnesota, 
where the state signs leases on private land to allow public individuals to come hunt that land. So there, there are ways to do this. And if you bring it back home, what is the difference in that, Ricky, where there's a public benefit as opposed to us having hundreds of thousands of dollars in leases in private buildings to house state employees? That's public dollars going to private individuals for a state benefit. Yeah. So this one, in my mind, is even much more important than that one. Uh, when you're when you're preserving such a rich uh, culture and and you know conservation efforts across this entire state, and, and it's something that we're 100 percent uh, behind for sure. Well, you know, the thing that got my attention as it related to having sort of a dedicated source of funding is that when you look at the matching funds that are available, the vast majority of the matching funds are in the farm bill, and that is for private land. I can't imagine doing a conservation effort in this state that doesn't involve the farmers because, they, I mean, I mean, look, I mean, if you think about loss of habitat and whatever, anything that farmers can do to enhance their lands for wildlife, outdoors enjoyment or wildlife habitat or whatever is going to be, it's going to be really important. If you look at, look at the success of the CRP and, and WRP programs since 1985, I mean, right. I, I read a story this morning that said nearly 40 million outdoorsmen and women have benefited because of those programs. That's just, that's just one, an, one angle. What I like about what you've done by bringing the NGOs in like Ducks Unlimited and the Nature Conservancy, et cetera, is that you're saying, you know, by having them all at the table, you have more thoughts at the table, more creativity, and the potential for incredible innovation by bringing them together and sort of ultimately sort of making it a competitive thing. But we got to first get aligned around the goals, don't we? That's right. And one of the best things out of this whole thing that, uh, that I really loved, that after that first meeting, we had some folks come out of there and saying, I have never in my life sat in a room with, with all those different groups represented. And that's what it's about. It's about teamwork and being a uniter and, and bringing a group together who have the intelligence, who have the know-how. We just got to figure out how do we fund these things and what is the plan by which we can follow to make them all happen over time. And so really excited about our efforts. And again, it's teamwork. It's a great group of individuals working together on behalf of all Mississippians. Well, as a hunter and a fisherman, I really congratulate you on having the wisdom to understand that if we don't tackle the conservation issues in this state as a team, you can't exclude anybody. You need everybody involved. You need hunters and fishermen. You need bird watchers. You need everybody. You need every organization that's focused on conservation engaged in the conversation. You need every leader engaged in the conversation. You need the legislature aligned. I mean, like I said, we had a, a you know the bill passed – uh, the House 117 to 2 has been reintroduced, and we've got a couple of different versions. We're not getting into all these versions yet because we don't know what's going to shake out of the system, but at least we're going to have a good conversation. What I'm looking forward to understanding is where is the leadership on the Senate side coming from? There are a lot of people who enjoy the outdoors. There are a lot of senators who get the fact that Mississippi is the capital of the outdoors in the United States and that we've got to put things in place to move this ball forward. I'm really looking forward to watching uh, where that leadership comes from, but you're doing what you can do from your position and you're pretty determined, aren't you? Uh, absolutely. We're not going to let this one go. It's a, it's a long-term plan. Uh, it's going to take a lot of work by a lot of folks, but I'm excited to see really just the excitement itself from all of these individuals. Again, you know, these are folks that perhaps they hadn't had an opportunity to talk with the folks at DEQ or with uh, DMR or whomever, well, now we're all in the same room sharing different ideas and, hey, look, I saw this in another part of the country. Maybe it'll work here. And that's the beautiful thing of it. All of our ideas working together for the good of Mississippi. It's, it's a great list of, of people. Uh, I, I love that you had Craig Ray from Visit Mississippi there. You think about how that's bringing people in from all over the country and Mike McCormick and Don Brazil from the foundation. And again, Alex Littlejohn from from the Nature Conservancy. What a bright young mind he is. What what Good Lord. And, yeah, Ed Penny from Ducks Unlimited. I mean, Joe Spragans. I mean, Joe Spragans has reinvented himself a thousand times. I mean, it's unbelievable. I mean, I told him he could have rode off into the sunset many moons ago, but he's now making his con contribution to coastal Mississippi in the way that he's doing today. But, you know, Robert Taylor and, I mean, listen, I can, we can't name them all, but what a great list of leaders. You cannot go wrong, buddy, when you bring that many people into a conversation, can you? No, not at all. And one of the great things I love is each of those names that you mentioned are basically from different parts of the state. And that's what makes this thing so important. Frank Howell and the Delta Delta Council, again, people from different parts of the state. This is about the entire state of Mississippi, not just one area. 
Uh, so how do we make a plan to benefit all of us? And I, I'm excited about the work we're doing. Well, we're talking uh, with the Secretary of State, uh, Michael Watson, about uh, some efforts that he has had underway, a task force that he put together to try to understand kind of where are we? I mean, you got to, okay, in order to go where you want to go, which is to lead the nation, you got to know where you are now. That's and right. his effort was to try to understand what are some of the stumbling blocks, what are some of the lack of alignment that occurs re, you know, currently, where's the vision, what should the vision be, and where is it we should go? So if you know where you are going are now and you sort of have a vision of where you want to go, then you start to kind of lay out the, the strategic goals that you're going to have in order to achieve that. And I think one of the things that, that comes out of an effort like this is the reality that we have to do better. Mississippi has to do better. If we're going to keep up with our – we're one of only two states, incidentally, don't have a dedicated uh, funding mechanism for conservation uh, in the entire southeast. And uh, others have had this, this fund for many years, and they're getting ahead of us now. But with doing efforts like what Michael Watson has been involved in and, uh, and really you know, bringing really innovative, smart people to the table, you can't go wrong. Last word, uh, Michael? Well, you know, one of the things, and you, I think we saw the, or you saw the survey, important to point out there, 80% in some of these responses. So this isn't just, you know, our NGOs. This is NGO and state agencies identifying these same issues. Uh, so again, just putting these folks together in the same room has been very beneficial. And uh, we're determined to make this work. We're determined to have a long-term plan that all of us uh, can benefit from here in Mississippi. This is Michael Watson, the Secretary of State for the great state of Mississippi. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate you, my friend. Yeah, uh, we're going to come, yeah, when we come back, we'll have Houston Havens, the Waterfowl Program Coordinator for the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. I'll see you after this break. Welcome back to Super Talk Outdoors from the Foundation Studio. I really enjoyed that conversation with Michael Watson, uh, the Secretary of State of Mississippi, and um, I, I congratulate him for 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 his leadership in bringing these incredibly important leaders, conservation leaders in our state, together into one room, and uh, from government, from from non governmental organizations, and just leaders in general. Um, to bring them together to talk about how do we sustain a, an incredibly important conservation effort in this state that keeps us the capital of the outdoors for, for, for Mississippi. And I promise you, we're not going to get into a bunch of policy mumbo-jumbo here on, out, on, uh, on Super Talk Outdoors, but we will talk about issues and why issues that, that happen in Jackson, things that happen in Jackson, matter to you as outdoorsmen and women because we need you. We, we're going to, on this on this conservation trust fund. Make a note of it. Do some research. Pay attention to what we say here on this show. We're going to need you to 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 make some phone calls at some point if we if we don't get movement on this bill the way we need to get movement. We need to we need to let them hear the voice of the outdoors community if this thing doesn't proceed well. It got stopped last year. Hopefully, it won't get stopped this year. We need we need a dedicated funding mechanism, and I congratulate the Secretary of State Michael Watson for the work that he's doing to uh, to to create alignment and to understand better where is it we are now and where do we need to go and how do we best get there. I think it's terrific, and that's what it's all about. So now let's shift gears. I want to move over to my friend, the uh, the Waterfowl Program co uh, Coordinator for the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks, Houston Havens, and just say good, first of all, good afternoon, Houston. How are you? Hey, good afternoon. I'm doing well. How about you? I'm doing great, man. I told you during the break, we had a great hunt yesterday. Six of, six of us in a duck blind got there early, you know, got the decoys out. Man, they were they were starting to pour in, obviously, before the hunting light. And then we had a really good hunt. I mean, it wasn't it, we didn't completely limit, but, man, it was just constant activity, constant shooting. We brought uh, some Koneka sausage and some bacon and some biscuits, and we cooked in the blind, and, man, we did a lot of laughing. I don't know anyone who hunts in a duck hunting scenario who doesn't laugh a lot. Isn't that, is that, isn't that true, buddy? It is. You know, uh, duck hunting is a, a really uh, a great opportunity for socialization. You know, while you're, while you're out in the outdoors, uh, you don't have to be really quiet like you do maybe with deer hunting or, or turkey hunting so it, it provides a little bit of a, a different aspect as far as that goes but yeah i mean whether it's a, a good season or 
or a bad season. Uh, there's always some some stories that are going to go along with the season, and uh, those will uh, sometimes those will last for a little while, and sometimes they'll last for a long time, depending on the stories. You know, you say whether it's a good season or a bad season, it's really interesting what has happened to waterfowl hunting in the last 10 or 15 years in Mississippi. There's a lot of different theories about it. I've had Ed Penny on from Ducks Unlimited, Chuck Cage, who's a, a guide up in the Mississippi Delta. He has this theory that things have sort of shifted to the West. But I, don't, I think everyone understands that one of the most challenging aspects of the waterfowl scenario that we face today is really the loss of habitat, you know, just literally all, all the way up the flyway, not just including Mississippi. Um, but the but the reality is we have our challenges and you know depending on where you hunt you could have amazing hunts or you could have like not even see a bird and it used to not be like that and that frustrates people doesn't it it does you know um it, it's but because of the migratory nature of waterfowl you know they're highly mobile they're good at sampling their environments and, and finding quality food resources um, they're good at, at survival you know is the bottom line there and so they're very smart, uh, very uh, well adapted to to assess things and, and weigh the risks. And so, uh, part of the fun, you know, that makes it a, a challenge, especially being uh, in Mississippi, a waterfowl hunter on the southern end of the flyway. Uh, we usually get the the most educated birds by the time they get here, and uh, so that's that's you know part of the challenge that makes it fun. Hey, let's do. I want to talk about how this season went. We'll talk about the upcoming youth season and the, also the youth waterfowl camp. But before we do that, where did your love of the outdoors come from? Uh, well, I was born and raised on a farm in Mississippi, and so it, I kind of fell into it naturally. Um, as with most people, I would say, you know, just having a, a family that had a, a hunting tradition background uh, was really easy to get involved with that. And then as I got into probably later in my years in high school, I started to to realize that there were, you know, people that actually, you know, work in conservation for a living. And uh, so that that really was right up my alley. And so I really took a hold of that and, uh, and pursued that as, as hard as I could. You know, if you look at, uh, I've had so many incredibly uh, dedicated people who work for the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries and Parks. They all have this similar story in, in, in that they grew up hunting and fishing. They fell in love with it. It kind of became sort of their passion. It's still their passion today. But along the way, you know, so many of them went to Mississippi State. Some went to other colleges. And they specialized in something that ultimately brought them to the department. And now they're, you know, they're, they're smart people. You know, what's interesting about people who are at the department, they could have gone off to be doctors and lawyers and whatever they want to be. And, but they, they loved the outdoors. They fell in love with conservation and the, and the role that they could play in making Mississippi the best it could be. And, uh, you know, really that, I, I mean, that's a, that's pretty, pretty evident in, in, with your brother in there at the department, isn't it? It is. You know, we've got, like you said, a lot of really good, talented, really smart people uh, working in, in conservation, not just in Mississippi, but we work, you know, outside of the state borders with people in other states um, because we're we're kind of all in this together as far as, as conservation, especially when it relates to migratory birds like waterfowl. And so, yeah, a lot of people that are really dedicated uh, could have done, you know, maybe maybe other things that people would, you know, qualify as being more successful. But um, they uh, they just follow their passion, and uh, we've got a lot of a lot of good people who are, you know, really dedicated to it. We'll we'll come to next in, in just a second about what your assessment of this particular waterfowl season. But what's your theory? What's your going theory? When you're when you're at a dinner party with someone and somebody says. What's happened in the past 10 years in Mississippi? What's, what's your answer? How do you answer them? Well, like you said, when we started, a lot of, a lot of different reasons. Uh, it's a really, a really complex uh, situation. Um, starts with migration, uh, the reason why birds migrate in the first place. Uh, much of that is weather related, you know, not just weather here in Mississippi, but it takes you know, good uh, snow cover, ice cover, and for a sustained amount of time, that's a, a part that a lot of people don't really think about. When they think about migration, they'll, you know, pull up a weather app on their phone and see a couple of days of freezing temperatures and, and get really excited. And, you know, that with good reason, I mean, you can definitely get some, some pushes of migration, as we like to call it, from, um, from a couple of days of cold weather. But um, it's really the more overall long-term picture of, you know, what 
weather conditions are and, and how long they're sustained that are really, you know, fueling a, a major migration. So uh, that's part of it on the front end. You know, habitat loss, like you said, all the way from the breeding grounds to wintering habitat in Mississippi. You know, things are changed. Land practice uses change, uh, especially in the Mississippi Delta. Um, we don't see as much winter water on the landscape as we used to see. And so that, especially in a year like this year, when we're relatively dry throughout the winter, don't get a lot of natural overbank flooding from river systems. Um, there's just not as much of what we would call setting the table for quality waterfowl habitat uh, in a lot of areas. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I, I wonder, too, I, it may be related, by the way, to uh, um, you know, not having super cold winters, you know, certainly at the beginning of the winter uh, up north, and and you, you mentioned the weather aspect to it. But I, at this, we have a 100-acre cypress lake at our main farm, and uh, it used to be that ducks were there pr pretty regularly and had some really good hunts. Not that there's not a few ducks from time to time, but our neighbor told us it was either last year or the year before last that in February he saw thousands of, of mallards just, just all, suddenly get there. So what that tells me is that they were coming, they just came late. And then last year we, we leased a new farm over in Chula uh, last year and for first hunting this year. There was some sheet water adjacent to uh, this farm, and uh, and we walked out, we pulled out, and on this sheet water, layers and layers and layers of of uh, mallards, I mean, just just cupping and and swirling and landing in the buddy. It was unbelievably beautiful, but it was nearly the end of February. It was nearly the end of February. So are the ducks maybe still coming to some extent, but they're just getting here later. So that is one observation that we hear a lot, um, especially after a tough duck season. Uh, we'll start to, you know, hear people, you know, they'll call our office or, you know, shoot us an email talking about seeing exactly what you just described. Um, some years that very well could be the case. You'll remember back last year we had a, a really hard freeze uh, in February, and you know we definitely feel like, you know, some birds were probably pushed back south uh, when that event occurred, but. Uh, a lot of Februarys, we get what we call, what we would term uh, the board pulling effect. Um, today's the last day of duck season, and so a lot of uh, land managers will be draining the water off of their wetlands and, and moving on to other things. You know, they're going to be farming or, or whatever, you, you know, their intent for that land is. And so what we see is a, a really big decrease in the amount of available habitat in February. That's a, that is a big deal, and most of the experts that I talked to have talked about that. Hey, we are talking with Houston Havens. He's the Waterfowl Program Coordinator for the state of Mississippi. When we come back, we'll get his read on this season, and we'll talk about the upcoming uh, waterfowl uh, youth season. We'll see you after this break. We live in one of the best places in America to enjoy the outdoors. So let's talk about it. It's Super Talk Outdoors with Ricky Matthews on Super Talk Mississippi. Welcome back to Super Talk Outdoors. We have uh, a great visit from uh, Houston Havens, the Waterfowl Program Coordinator for the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. And when we went to break, we were just sort of talking about what's what is the situation. And you, you think about you think about winter uh, coming kind of late in the season. You're not getting the cold air. I'm mean, excuse me, the cold the cold weather up north of us is pushing the birds down. You have it's also uh, combined without a loss of habitat. And then and then the point that he made toward the end, pulling the boards because there's a lot of there's a lot of sheet water and flooded timber that's created. But once the farming operations get start to kick back in, those boards get pulled and those uh, those valves get opened up and some some lakes and sheet water gets drained and that's a loss of habitat. So and as you pointed out, ducks are really 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 smart about how to stay alive for the most part, and uh, and they they pick up on that from one year to the next, and it does affect what their patterns are going to be. But let's uh, let's come back to um, what's your read on this season, this this two thousand. 21-2022 season? I would say the, the overall point is just how dry it was. Uh, starting off especially, uh, you know, duck season in Mississippi typically opens late November. And part of 
we had a, a bit of success actually in the beginning of the season because of the dry weather. You know, things were just so dry. There were a lot of, uh, you know, agricultural uh, operations still going on with getting crops out of fields. But areas like wildlife management areas and national wildlife refuges that had intensively managed uh, waterfowl habitat with pumping capabilities were able to put some some water on the landscape and. We didn't have to have a lot of birds in the Mississippi Delta to take advantage of um, those opportunities just because there was you know, limited habitat on the landscape. So I would say we started off with good hunting success in those areas. Uh, public lands with water were, were very popular. You know, a lot of people were showing up uh, to hunt those areas. And then as we moved into December, things just kind of, kind of stayed mild, especially well to the north of us. And so we didn't really see a, a large push of, of migratory birds coming into the state, uh, basically for the majority of December. And so that was kind of a, what hunters would call a lull in the season. We got into early January, things picked up. We started to get some, some weather that was conducive to, to pushing birds south. And so uh, hunting reports started to pick up some. We actually saw our peak numbers from waterfowl surveys in early January. Um, and then uh, things kind of, kind of followed a, a more normal weather situation as far as Mississippi goes from there on out. So I feel like it was a strong end to the season. Uh, today's the last day and some people are still out there, you know, uh, taking advantage of that. Yeah, it was dry is really I, a lot of the places where we hunt, man, there was in some of the bottoms, there was literally no water until maybe just a few weeks ago. That makes a big difference. And your point about where where uh, wetlands and and waterfowl hab habitat are maintained and and really cared after by pumping and, and so on, uh, you did really well. Which is the point. The point there is that if you create habitat, if you if you really focus on, on habitat creation, which should be a, more, a stronger goal for the state going forward, we could really we could do we could do well in that area. I have a friend of mine who has uh, land at pa Panther Swamp, and it was basically dry. So, um, you know, I know you've heard that all up and down. And yet, then you had this incredible acorn crop, you know, unbelievable acorn crop, which changed the deer season in some ways. It was very interesting. And just all in all, just a different kind of a season. Still fun, still fortunate to be here in Mississippi. And you've got, you've got the youth hunt coming up next weekend. That's right. Um, you know, always excited about uh, having that uh what we would call a post regular season at least opportunity for youth to be able to to get out and uh give it one last go you know uh, hopefully some youth that were able to to get out and experience some in the regular season and then uh have have those last two days next saturday and sunday focused on just them getting them out and uh hopefully having uh having a few birds uh, i know we're going to have some cold weather then I love those dedicated youth hunts, you know, whether it's deer or, or waterfowl. I just think it's so awesome. It really, you know, in cases where people are not already including youth in, in their hunting activities, it really sort of forces that opportunity. And you're, ta you're talking about making impressions, as you, as you talked about when you were a young child, as I talk about when I was a young child with Michael Watson, you know, the impact that it had on him as a young child. You're making impressions on young people that will make them lifelong enjoyers of the outdoors that's just a reality very there are very few exceptions to that you also have uh is a, we're coming to the end of the segment together but the uh, youth file water file camp coming up tell me about that yeah really successful event i think this will be our 12th year now uh to do this camp uh, basically it's targeted at uh choosing youth who have limited or, or basically no waterfowl hunting experience, bringing them in uh, really intensive on education, just getting them out in wetlands, showing uh, how we manage wetlands, looking at birds, and then of course, taking them on a, on a hunt to wrap up the weekend, uh, which may be for a lot of kids, their first time to get out. Yeah, that's fe February 4th through the 6th. You can look it up. That's called the 2022 Youth Waterfowl Camp. This has been uh, my friend Houston H Havens, who's the Waterfowl Program Coordinator. I mentioned to him during the break, he's a terrific communicator. I've really enjoyed sort of talking to you about the waterfowl situation in Mississippi and can't wait for you to come back again. Talk to you soon, my friend. Oh, I absolutely appreciate it. Hope you have a great day. And as you continue to enjoy the outdoors, just remember one major rule from Super Talk Outdoors. Don't drop your guard. Stay safe. Please stay safe. Always keep safety first. Have a great day. and We'll see you next Monday. Mississippi